it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. No, it's really not. It's the coldest damn spring we've ever had. And it's going to be summer soon. <clears throat> Hi, welcome to tonight's show. My voice sucks. <clears throat> uh, what else can I say? It's... Uh... <laughs> <coughs> oh, hey, ho. Oh, it's uh, Christmas in May. What a great way to start off the month. Huh? Let's talk about Christmas. No, I, you know, I'm... a. <sighs> I love Christmas, man. I am. So I talk about how oft, I talk about often on this channel that I am a Jew, but I am a Jew who loves Christmas because to me, Christmas is indeed an American holiday tradition. You know what I'm saying? Um, it doesn't matter what I practice, what I follow, what I subscribe to, because at the end of the day, it's still an American pastime, a beloved American pastime, you know, with Christmas specials and Christmas movies and, you know, Coca-Cola commercials. I find I know this sounds weird. And, you know, I'm sure if you are Christian, you might not like the commercialization of your holiday, but. I think there's many different prisms to look at Christmas through. And one of them is totally secular and for people who aren't Christian like myself. And so I love Christmas. I love everything about Christmas. I do. I love the decorations. I love the atmosphere. I love what, um, you know, I love that it's about family. I love that you give presents. I love that. You know, you have like a, a what is it, a chicken dinner or turkey dinner. I love the and, you know, it's interesting. Even if some of that stuff is hard to reconcile because of the religious stuff, there's some people who don't like religious stuff, period. You know, you can look or at least, you know, they don't maybe they don't like the Christian stuff. You can look at the fact that Christmas has so much of its roots tied to paganism. There's so much paganism in Christmas in the fact that, you know, you have the Yule, the Yule tree. Uh, it's on the, it celebrates, it's on the winter solstice. Supposedly Jesus was actually born in, in January. That's when the Greek, the Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox church and another church, a bunch of churches, they celebrate Christmas in January because that's supposedly when Jesus was actually born. But um, they moved it so that it aligns with the winter solstice. It's the same thing with Easter. Easter is uh, the the spring, the 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 the, the birth of of of, of a new, you know, uh, the rabbits and the eggs. All that stuff is pagan stuff that's tied into what Easter is about for Christians. So it's like it's like this smatter. There's some. My point with all of this is, and I hope I'm not offending any Christians when I say this stuff. It's not my intention to do so. Um, my, my point is, is that there is something to love for everybody on every level, whether you are like a super religious Christian, or if you're a Jew like me, who doesn't practice Christianity at all, you know what I'm saying? Um, I just, I just love it. I just love it. And what's interesting is I, you know, I don't know very much about how it became an American holiday. Cause that's how, I, as I said, that's how I think about it. I think about it just like Thanksgiving. It is just the thing that happens after Thanksgiving. Uh, I found an article on Big Think. It's it's called How Christmas Became an American Holiday Tradition with the Santa Claus Gifts and a, and a Tree. Uh, DLW says, I've got no problem with Christmas except the carols. I despise them. I even like the, I love the carols, man. Our, our neighbors are Christian and they knocked on our door and did the Christmas carol thing. I loved it, man. I sang, I sang, I sang with them. I sang with them and I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, DLW says Christmas over here during the summer is during the summer. And we have that delicious, super high caloric food, which doesn't blend well with the heat, but it's delicious. Love Christmas food and being with my tribe, uh, DLW, if you don't mind me asking, where are you, uh, geographically in, in the country? Uh, Amy loves Christmas. She's more spiritual than religious. That's great. That's great. I, I identify as spiritual as well. 
for sure. Um, <laughs> it's being Jewish and spiritual. Um, so I'm all the way on the other end of the spectrum when it comes to when it comes to Christmas. But the other thing that's very interesting is or the thing I really like kind of want to talk about a little bit too is like this I idea of juxtaposing coca-cola with santa claus i think that's interesting the commercialization of santa claus for coca-cola i'm having the worst bad hair day i can't stop trying to push my hair back here i'm growing my hair long you guys it's time i'm gonna get it's gonna have my long flowing locks probably for the last time i don't know i don't know but i'm gonna try it i'm gonna try it see what happens uh, pretty soon I won't be needing to wear a hat or it won't be wanting to wear a hat. All right, let's, so this was from post, this was posted on December 24th, 24th. There's just such like a vibe. There's like a vibe on Christmas, you know, on, um, there's just a vibe on Christmas Eve, you know, especially if it's like snowing, like I spent a Christmas in Breckenridge, Colorado, which is where I was just recently when we almost had our airplane crash. Go go read that story is on the channel. And um, there's something about like just the the small town snowy atmosphere, warm fires, cozy inside. I just love it. I love that stuff. Oh, that's interesting. Well, so DLW is from Argentina. So Christmas is during the summertime on our side of the globe. Wow, dude. I, I thought you were in America. That's so cool. So DLW is, is uh, coming. That's right. When you go below a certain, when you go below the hemisphere, when you go to the southern hemisphere, the uh, seasons are reversed. That is so cool, man. That is so cool. Let's dive into our little article here. Now that we've done our little warm up intro and talked about uh, stuff and whatnot. Hold on. Um, by the way, just want to put this out there. If you are a Patreon or a YouTube member, go check the leaving pizza punk interview is live for you guys exclusive early exclusive for all you guys thank you so much for your patience and your support really appreciate it hope you enjoy that for everybody else you're gonna have to wait a little bit longer but it will be coming um okay hold on here we go here's the article i just love i just love this little this environment this little thing you get this little Santa drinking his Coca-Cola. See, that's what I love. That's I love that imagery. I just love it. It just makes me feel so good inside. I, I can't explain why that is, but it it just is. It is what it is, and that's all that it is. Um, let me see if I can pin this to the top. Yep, there we go. All right. So this is written by Thomas Adam, and it was from last uh, December. Each season... The celebration of Christmas has religious leaders and conservatives publicly complaining about the commercialization of the holiday and the growing lack of Christian sentiment. Because that's the thing, too. You know, there is that there's that whole movement about put the Christ back in Christmas. And that's what's kind of interesting, because when you look at the word Christmas, it's Christ. It's Christ mass. It's this mass for Christ on his birthday, celebrating the birth of the Lord of the Christians. Right. Um, but it's just, it's metamorphosized into something so much more. And that's partially due to the commercialization. The gift giving aspects have been so blown out of the proportion of what I guess Christmas used to be about. And that's part of the American tradition. It, it's giving presents to your loved ones, right? Such perceptions about Christmas celebrations have, however, little basis in history. As a scholar of transnational and global history, I have studied the emergence of Christmas celebrations in German towns around 1800 and the global spread of this holiday ritual. Ah, so it originates in German towns? Am I reading that correctly? That is fascinating. While Europeans participated in church services and religious ceremonies to celebrate the birth of Jesus for centuries— they, I just watched The Green Knight, and it takes place on Christmas. And they, yeah, that's what they do. It's like, that's the party, man. You go do mass. You go do Christ mass at midnight or whatever. Uh, they did not commemorate it as we do today, saying 
the the these are the Europeans who participated in the church services. Christmas trees and gift giving on December 24th in Germany did not spread to other European Christian cultures until the end of the 18th century and did not come to new uh, to North America until the 1830s. That's interesting. And then when is, hold on, let's take a look here. Uh, when is a Christmas carol written? Because I feel like a lot of the modern modernization, modern traditions and ideas come from like a Christmas carol too. Charles Dickens Christmas Carol. Let's see what it pops up here. Uh oh, um, a Christmas Carol is from, no, that's not what we want. That's not what we want. Let's do this again. Charles Dickens Christmas Carol. There we go. Okay. So it was published in 1843, 178 years ago. That's really interesting, man. That is really, really, really interesting. Um, let's see here. So did not come to America. So European Christian cultures until the end of the 18th century, even though Christmas Carol is written in 1843. Uh, Charles Haswell, an engineer and chronicler of everyday life in New York City, wrote in his reminiscences, reminisce, reminiscences, remin to reminisce, reminiscences. You try saying that word. It's not easy. Remin to rem the reminiscences of an octogarian, which is somebody who's in their 80s, that in the 1830s, German families living in Brooklyn, dressed up Christmas trees with lights and ornaments. Haswell was so curious about this novel custom that he went to uh, that he went to Brooklyn in a very stormy and wet night just to see the Christmas trees through the windows of the private homes. That's so beautiful, man. Imagine walking up. Imagine it's snowing and you're walking through a neighborhood. There's snow dusting the, the, the sidewalks and everything. And you're just looking at people's uh, Christmas trees. So you have, it's German. And that's the thing again, once again, what makes America so great? I <laughs> not good words to use in the post 2016 world, but you know, what makes America great? Um, immigrants, man, immigrants bringing their traditions and cultures and allowing them to be infused. They get infused into America's tapestry of culture. And so something that comes from Germany that obviously spreads from much older and ancient traditions. Again, that's something that survived from the Yule, the Yule tree for Yule, which is which is a pagan, which is a uh, sort of like a pagan celebration of the winter solstice, you know, um, that gets added in to, to sort of placate the, the pagans who are converting to Christianity or to help convert them to Christianity. Oh, yeah, we're going to keep our Yule. That's cool. We'll do the Christian thing. Um, and it survives all the way to the 1830s when German families living in Brooklyn are dressing up Christmas trees with lights and ornaments. Wow. Uh, the first Christmas trees in Germany only in the late 1790s did the new custom of putting up. A, okay. never mind. I guess that's, <laughs> I guess it took that happened in the 1790s. Although I, I feel like, again, that's something that goes, that dates way back. Only in the late 1790s did the new custom of putting up a Christmas tree decorated with wax candles. And that sounds like a forest uh, fire hazard waiting to happen. Uh, you would decorate the tree with wax candles and ornaments and exchange gifts uh, that all emerged from Germany. This new holiday practice was completely outside and independent of Christian religious practices. Wow. Let's take that one more time. Only in the late 1790s did the new custom of putting up a Christmas tree decorated with wax candles and ornaments and exchanging gifts emerge in Germany. This new holiday practice was completely outside and independent of Christian religious practices. The idea of putting wax candles on an evergreen was inspired by the pagan tradition of celebrating the winter solstice with bonfires on December 21st. These bonfires on the darkest day of the year were intended to recall the sun and show her the way home. That's beautiful too, man. The lit Christmas tree was essentially a domesticated version of these bonfires. Oh, man. I, I don't know. I, I find this stuff so fascinating, man. Uh, the English poet Samuel Ter Taylor 
Col Coleridge, Coleridge uh, gave the very first description of a decorated Christmas tree in a, in a German household where he reported in 1799 about having seen such a tree in a private home in Reitsburg in northwestern Germany. In 1816, German poet E.T.A. Hoffman published his famous story, Nutcracker and Mouse King. This story contains the very first literary record of a Christmas tree decorated with apples, sweets, and lights. It just puts a smile on my face, man. Uh, from the onset, all family members, including children, were expected to participate in the gift giving. So even if you were a kid and, well, you know, the, with child labor, labor laws being what they were back in the day, uh, non-existent kids are, you know, <laughs> kids are bringing home the bacon too. Maybe they, you know, some of that movie gets part, that money gets partitioned for Christmas presents for everybody. Right. Uh, gifts were not brought by a mystical figure, but openly exchanged amongst family members, symbolizing the new middle-class culture of egalitarianism. Wow. Let's, let's look up what egalitarianism means. I mean, I've heard that word. We've heard that word in the past, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Is it going to let me? It's not going to. Sure. Search Google for egalitarianism. Let's see what comes up. The doctrine that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. That's cool, man. Right. And that makes sense with the middle class. From German roots to American soil. Ready? Um. American visitors to Germany in the first half of the 19th century realized the potential of the celebration for nation building. In 1835, Harvard professor George Tickner was the first American to observe and participate in this type of Christmas celebration and to praise its usefulness for creating a national culture. Wow. Uh, that year, Tickner and his 12-year-old daughter, Anna, joined the famous Count von Ungernsternberg. <laughs> Un Sternberg in Dresden for a memorable Christ uh, Christmas celebration. And also, we all know what comes out of Germany as well, the idea of Krampus. You have Krampus, and then there's Krampusnacht, which is where uh, Krampus, who's kind of like the evil version of Santa Claus, who will take away all the naughty children and, you know, the, the kids will get uh, gobbled up and whatnot and yada, yada, yada. Other American visitors to Germany, such as Charles Loring Brace, who witnessed, so you have like these influential Americans coming over to Germany, seeing what's going on and then bringing that stuff back as well, who witnessed a Christmas celebration in Berlin nearly 20, 20 years later, considered it a specific German festival with the potential to put people to pull people together so maybe that's why it's so widespread or it became so popular i mean it's the biggest holiday besides thanksgiving it becomes the biggest holiday in america and i would say christmas is christmas the is christmas most widely celebrated in america i want to say yes i mean i guess maybe you have it in france you have it in in germany you have i mean you have it all over it's not to say that you don't you have it everywhere it's a worldwide global thing but I'm talking about like where it's like a real like big thing. I mean, in Muslim countries, it's not going to be celebrated as much. It's not going to be a national holiday in, I don't know, like Turkey, right? Um, for both uh, Tickner and Brace, this holiday tradition proved the emotional glue that could bring families and members of a nation together. So here's what's interesting. In a weird kind of way, Christmas is like Shabbat for the Jews. The point of Shabbat, Shabbat dinner, one of the points of Shabbat and like, you know, just not turning off all the electronics and just hanging out together. It, it in turn, Shabbat is supposed to also be this day of rest. It's also supposed to be emotional glue that brings families together to spend quality time together to get away from the busy week. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like, Christmas is like the annual version of that, right? In 1843, and I mean, listen, all Jews are affected by Christmas in America. All American Jews are affected by Christmas in one way or another because of the fact that it's a national holiday. It shuts down. So what do Jews do on Christmas? 
We have our own Christmas traditions. That's right. Jews who do not practice Christianity or do not celebrate Christianity have Christian tra uh, Christmas traditions themselves because of they live in a world where it's an it's a it's a national holiday. So what's one of those traditions? To we go to the movies and we eat Chinese food. Why? Because in, generally Chinese restaurants remain open. It's the only place where you can get a really good meal on the holiday. So that in turn becomes that in turn becomes like a cultural thing for Jews who live in America. It's like really interesting stuff when you think about it, how that all sort of works, right? Uh, in 1843, Tickner invited several prominent friends to join him in a Christmas celebration with a Christmas tree and gift giving in his Boston home. So he brought it back. He loved it so much that he brought it back from Germany brought it to Boston. Hey, Bob, George, Robert, Timmy, um, uncle Fred, why don't you guys come over? We're going to, I want to show you this thing. It's called it's, I want to show you this Christmas celebration. No, 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 no. no we're not going to go to church. You're going to come over to my house. We're going to put a tree up in the house. What do you mean a tree up in the house? Yeah. We're going to put a tree up in the house and we're going to celebrate Christmas. Tickner's holiday party was not the first Christmas celebration in the United States that featured a Christmas tree. German American families had brought the custom with them and put up trees before. However, it was Tickner's social influence that secured the spread and social acceptance of the alien custom to put a Christmas tree up and to exchange gifts in American society. So I guess you can really trace it back to this guy Tickner in 1843. That's crazy. And to think about how widespread it became. And mind you, Santa Claus has not even been introduced yet. And before we introduce Santa Claus, let's take a quick moment to talk about our sponsor, uh, riotstickers.com. We are running a special contest with riotstickers.com. You can win 20 free custom t-shirts with any design that you want. Look at my design. I could put my design on a t-shirt. Look at the banner behind me. See that? Do you need stickers? Just go to riotstickers.com. We're still running that special promotion, uh, 50 stickers deal. Uh, check it out. It, link is in the description. Use the promo code FROMIS. Uh, let's play the little video, the little video spiel, shall we? Glockenspiel. <laughs> it's right. Hi, I'm a guy from riotstickers.com, the merch company known for being the bomb. Do you hate going to work? But like getting paid? Do you hate snow? But want to make sweet, sweet love to a snowman. That was unexpected. All right, what about this? Do you hate paying for stuff, but like having custom t-shirts? You are in luck. We can't help with the snowman thing. That's probably going to take a therapist. But RiotStickers.com is giving you a chance to win a free order of custom shirts. And entering is easier than like making sweet, sweet Get her out of here. <clears throat> All you have to do is simply go to riotstickers.com slash win and enter your name and email address. Riot Stickers will have a random drawing to pick a winner. So head to riotstickers.com slash win for your chance to win free custom shirts. And be sure to check out other custom merch while you're there because it is the bomb. Riot Stickers.com, Riot Stickers, we are the bomb. Riot Stickers.com, Riot Stickers, we are the bomb. Okay, and we're back, and now let's dive into the Santa Claus bit. So now Santa Claus gets introduced. For most of the 19th century, that's the 1800s, the celebration of Christmas with Christmas trees and gift-giving remained a marginal phenomenon in American society, so it hasn't exploded yet. Most Americans remained skeptical about this new custom. Some felt that they had to choose between older English customs, such as hanging stockings for presents on the fireplace. Ah, so that's interesting. So the so that's where that comes from. So all of these things, they all just get sort of smattered together to make modern Christmas. So the hanging of stockings is an older English custom. So you hang them the stockings for presents on the fireplace and the Christmas tree uh, as a proper space. Blah, blah, sorry. Uh, some felt that they had to choose between the old English customs, such as hanging stockings for presents on the fireplace and the Christmas tree as a proper space for placing of gifts. It was also hard to find the necessary ingredients for this German custom. Christmas tree farms had first to be created and ornaments needed to be produced. 
So that back in the day, you'd go into the woods, you'd find a nice timber, a nice tree. Terrible that the tree had to die. Terrible they didn't have plastic trees, although I'm sure there'd be plenty of Christmas enthusiasts who would argue with me, telling me why Chris, a plastic tree wouldn't work. Um, but the most significant steps towards integrating Christmas into popular American culture came in the context of the American Civil War. In January 1863, Harper's Weekly published on its front page the image of Santa Claus visiting the Union Army in 1862. Let's take a look at the image. Wow. Whoa. All right, we got to look at this real quick. Hold on, let me see if I can share this with you as well, because this is, I feel like this is really important to look at as well. So this is the very first image of Santa Claus in America being kind of like introduced right there, man. Look at that. How cool is that? There he is, man. And he's wearing like, he, he's kind of like Captain America in a way. He's got stars and stripes on. So in a way, or maybe Uncle Sam. Holy crap. Okay. This is like a hot take right here. Uncle Sam is like the Santa Claus of America. What? Yeah, no, for real. Stars and stripes, long white beard, sort of like omnipotent. That's so crazy. That is so crazy. So see, so this was the photo. This was the bit. That was the photo that did that did it, man, that did it for America. That really sort of brought everything um, to a head. Oops. Uh, what am I doing here? Here we go. Can we see it? Yeah. That's crazy. So that's that was one of the most significant steps towards integrating Chris. That's like the equivalent putting putting Santa Claus on like a, a newspaper like that in 1863. That's like that's like airing a Santa Claus commercial during the Super Bowl, right? Like suddenly everybody is like, "Yo, Christmas, Saint Nick, blah 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 blah." This image which was produced by the German-American cartoonist Thomas Nast, represents the very first image of Santa Claus. In the following years, Nast developed the image of Santa Claus into the jolly old man with a big belly and a long white beard as we know it today. In 1866, Nast produced Santa Claus in his works. Let's take a look at this one as well. I'm sure it's, uh, it's very um, significant in its historical um context let me uh let me find it for you real quick just give me one second here folks here we go there she is it's coming right now so this is called santa claus and his works take a look at that isn't that great look at how interesting that is man for good children uh record of behavior so here's what's interesting so what do we see now? This has all of the stuff. The Christmas tree is in the bottom right here. The workshop is right here. Uh, Dolly's tea party is right here. Christmas Eve. Everything's represented here. Holiday week, making Dolly's clothes, Santa Claus and his works. Uh, on the lookout for good, good children. Here's Santa Claus looking down with a, with, a, with, a, with a telescope. That's how he would see. And he has an account book. Uh, a record of behavior. We can see all the various different toys. What a marvelous work that is. And, and that was the other thing. That's what cinches it. Suddenly, St. Nick is the guy who's making the, the toys, and he's synonymous with toys, and he's synonymous with good and bad behavior. Is And here's what's really interesting. And I don't want to, um, I think it's, I, I want to uh, uh, say what I'm about to say with sensitivity for our Christian brothers and sisters and, and people. I, I don't want to uh, offend anybody, but isn't it interesting how like, it's almost like, and this is just, this is an outside non-Christian perspective. When I'm looking at that photo in the way that like the idea of, of the theological idea of Christian heaven, of like what Christian heaven is in order to get into heaven, you have to be good. And the reward is eternal life in heaven, right? Um, uh, or if you're bad or whatever, if you do bad things and you get punished for eternity in hell. And what's interesting is uh, Santa Claus. And this, I guess maybe this is a more modern thing because this is recent. Santa Claus is like 
the child version of that. It's almost like, it's almost like the, it's like a trainer version of that. It's like, if you're really good, you're going to get presents. If you're really bad, you're going to get coal. And so like Santa Claus in a weird kind of way is like this, like this training figure for uh, other, I don't know, um, f- for bigger things, I guess, um, would be the way to to kind of look at that. And I just, I don't know, that realization just sort of hit me just now when I saw that that photo of, of Santa Claus and his works. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. So that is an elaborate drawing of Santa Claus's tasks from making gifts to recording children's behavior. This sketch also introduced the idea that Santa Claus traveled by a sled, a sledge drawn by reindeer. So all of this mythology starts to develop uh, with this, this, this tradition of Christmas, declaring Christmas, a federal holiday and putting it, putting up the first Christmas tree in the white house, mark the final steps in making Christmas an American holiday. All right, now this is fascinating. I had no, oh, oh, never mind. I thought that said 1970. And I was going to be like, wow, 1970, that's really late for that to happen. It happened er way earlier than that. Happened 100 years earlier. On June 28th, 1870, so it didn't take long, from 1843 to 1870 is not a lot of time. It's like 27 years. Congress passed the law that turned Christmas Day New Year's Day, Independence Day, and Thanksgiving Day into holidays for federal employees. So that is like the foundation of our holiday calendar is birthed on June 28th, 1870 with these major temple things. And the real tragedy, the real crime is that Halloween, All Hallows Eve, which came later, it wasn't as developed back then, uh, is not a, a federal holiday and it should be it really should be but it's not it's trivialized because it's not a holiday here's the thing new year's day christmas day independence day and thanksgiving day are all anchored around the idea that idea of emotional connection between family members about spending time with family yes you're supposed to spend time with your family on halloween but halloween is uh, a different type of social holiday and therefore maybe didn't appeal or has yet to appeal to lawmakers, but it should be, it should be a a national holiday as well. And then in December, 1889, president Benjamin Harrison began the tradition of setting up a Christmas tree in the white house. Christmas had finally become an American holiday tradition. Uh, This article is republished from the conversation under the creative commons license Read the original article. So cool. I mean, really, really interesting stuff. I just had I just had no idea. I had no friggin' idea, man. So even they're sort of aggregating this stuff from elsewhere. Does it say who the author was? No. Huh. It's the exact same article. It looks like it might have actually been written by. No, doesn't say. It does not say. It does not say. So there you have it, folks. Um, <laughs> Matt John says there ain't no san- sanity clause. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I just find this stuff so interesting. And I really do. I really do love exploring it. And then, you know, I guess the part two of this. And let's since we're always trying to be thorough here. Let's see if we can find something about Coca-Cola's campaign. When does Coca-Cola, when does Coca-Cola, um, history of, history of Coca-Cola and Santa Claus. Here we go. Let's see what pops up here. If we have any kind of, here we go. That'll be cool. Let's just to cap us off. Um, Oh, this is, this is crazy. Uh, this is really crazy. And I, you know, what's funny. I had, I had heard about this. I had heard about this. Um, all right, here's something even, even crazier. And maybe I should change, change the, the, the article. Oh man. Oh man. This is, this is actually kind of like a part two. I don't know. Maybe we should save it. 
maybe we should save it. Um, that is really, really cool. Uh, you know what? Let's get, let's go. Let's just dive into it real quick because we have it here. I, I'm not going to make a separate video about this here. So I had actually read a long time ago about how Santa Claus supposedly that Santa Claus is kind of invented by Coca-Cola. The, the modern version, this version of Santa Claus is, is di directly derived from Coca-Cola advertising. So Coca-Cola is so synonymous with, with Santa Claus in, in sort of like marketing and branding and um, commercialization that our, un our modern understanding of who Santa Claus is really is predicated on Coca-Cola. The invention of Santa Claus from Thomas Nast, who we just read about. I'm not going to repeat his name, but Thomas Nast to Coca-Cola. Um, and here are all the names. Not gonna, whatever name you happen to give him, Santa and his origins still spur controversy. Coca-Cola may have claimed ownership of the symbol and widely circulated the image of a bearded and smiling Santa Claus. Yet the brand didn't actually invent anything. Much earlier, American cartoonist Thomas Nast, fa yeah, but yes, yes, okay, fine. But, but it still doesn't look like this. That's what I mean. This idea of Santa Claus, this comes about because of Coca-Cola. I don't think that's quite correct. The, the character does not, the character of Santa Claus is believed to descend from Bishop Nicholas of Mira, who lived in the fourth century. I guess that's Saint Nicholas. Historians see his birth at between 250 and 270 in Lycia, present-day southwestern Turkey, and estimated that he became the Bishop of Mira around 315. Curiously, the church celebrates his birthday not on December 6th, but on the day of his death. Saint Nick was popular in his lifetime and had a reputation of being a miracle maker. His most famous achievement was the resurrection of three young boys killed in place in a salting tub by a butcher. Hmm. This, led, this episode led to him to be regarded as the patron saint of school children. So that's how that gets that gets uh, put put together. Uh, Nicholas becoming a saint at the end of the 11th century. Saint Nicholas's relics were transferred to Bari in southern Italy. His cult began in the northern Europe at the time of the Crusades, particularly in Lorraine, of which he became the patron saint in the Middle Ages. He is credited with one particular miracle, liberating the city of Nancy, capital of the Duchy of Lorraine, from its uh, Bur Burgundian assailants. Uh, the Basilica of St. Nicholas de Port, located about 10 kilometers from Nancy, was dedicated to him in the 15th century. Today, one can still admire the stained glass depiction of Nicholas carrying a bishop's cross and mitre meter. There he goes. It looks kind of like Santa Claus right there. Uh, the city of Port, now called St. Nicholas de Port and renowned for its fairs and markets, extended St. Nicholas's worship well beyond the duchy to Germany, Belgium, Portland, and the Netherlands, where he became known as Sinterklaas. How about that? Look at that. There's all the school kids. There's the donkey, a.k.a. the Rudolph. And there are the toys and, and, and gifts, accoutrement at the bottom. The cult of St. Nick did not escape Europe's religious upheavals. In Germany, when the Reformation led by the monk Martin Luther banned St. Worship, Nicholas was replaced by Christ Kindle, Christ Child. Even as St. Nicholas was chased away from the Lutheran uh, Protestant regions, he was welcomed in the Netherlands despite its Calvinist majority. The Feast of St. Nicholas painting, ex executed in 17th century by Jan Steen, for the first time depicts a family celebrating the Feast of St. Nicholas, a child, so that's where the feast comes from, right? It's the Feast of St. Nicholas. A child weeps after receiving a stick as a present. Oh, a stick. How lovely. While a little girl cuddles a miniature of the Bishop Saint the way she would a doll. When a group of Dutch Calvinists fleeing religious prosecution in the 17th century set sail for the new world, they carried the legend and exploits of, uh, and exploits of Sinterklaas with them. These immigrants found, uh, these immigrants, founders of New Amsterdam, the future New York, introduced Sinterklaas in their new homeland. Yet his Dutch name was distorted and Americanized into Santa Claus by the end. So that's what's interesting. So it's completely separate from everything we just talked about you have santa claus on a parallel like historical thing 
you know, historical branch that, but doesn't get bonded yet. Right. Isn't that crazy? Uh, but still the modern iconic image, I will, this is my hill. I will, I will die on this hill. He it's, it's absolutely synthesized by coca-cola by the end of the 18th century at the time of 1776 revolution santa claus became the symbol of american resistance against the british occupying forces saint nicholas was borrowed from a from this dutch tradition introduced in america by the earliest dutch immigrants for political reasons as a kind of antidote to christmas which was celebrated by the english enemy and by the british colonial monarchy his new fr his new fame spread all over the new world a larger than life santa claus more than a century had passed when the writer washington irving pub who lives right down who lived right down the the, the street for me uh, published a history of New York in 1809, comedically told by the make-believe historian Dietrich Nickenbacher, uh, which was Washington Irving's pen name. The book helped popularize the character of Santa Claus, but without Christmas and gave him an unprecedented profile. That's so interesting. Uh, by telling the humorous story of the founding of New York, Washington Irving was the first to make the literary transition from St. Nicholas to Santa Claus. Irving's uh, book recounts the odyssey of a Dutch crew leading Amsterdam in, in the 17th century for America. St. Nicholas, or Sinterklaas by his Dutch name, is the ship's figurehead, protecting them from the storm. The saint appears in dreams of sleeping sailors and expresses the wish to see the Dutch immigrants settle and build a city on the island of Manahata. In exchange, in exchange Sinterklaas promises to visit them every year on his airborne sleigh and ship down the chimneys of his newfound city to deliver gifts to children. A few years later in December, 1823, Clement Clark Moore, a professor at New York's Escapili Episcopalian seminary published a poem intended for his own child called twas the night before Christmas in the Sentinel, a New York state paper. That's in 1823. So well before 1843, 20 years prior, you have this Christmas lore sort of creeping into things. And it really does kind of begin on the East Coast, New York, Brooklyn, German homes in Brooklyn, Boston, the uh, what's his face, that dude. Uh, he presented uh, an he presented an as yet unseen Santa Claus, a cheery fellow with ruddy cheeks. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. Hmm. In this poem, inspired by folk legends of the German, Dutch, and Norwegian communities settled in the United States, one no longer recognizes the austere Bishop of Mira. The poem was an instant success and played that that's the twas the night before Christmas. The poem was an instant success and played a key role in introducing a portly and larger than life Santa Claus to the collective American imagination. While the color of his outfit was nowhere mentioned, this would change during the second half of the 19th century. Meanwhile, in England, where he was known as Old Father Christmas, no doubt inspired by the Sca Scandinavian god Odin. Santa Claus was often dressed in green and wore a, ho a holly crown over his head. That pagan figure appeared in numerous Victorian images. So all of this stuff just gets sort of pushed together. We're not going to read about Thomas Nast because we already did and we already know the deal. But here is, look, there's, there's Santa Claus. And yeah, like, I mean, he kind of has the, the look down in this picture to the left. This is 1884, by the way. But I mean the uh, just the the iconic red and white trim Santa Claus as we know him, that's that's solidified by Coca Cola man. And here's that first image of Santa Claus when he's secretly kind of like Uncle Sam, right? Uh, I'm gonna skip over this part. In parallel, uh, L Louis Prang, the man who introduced Christmas cards. To the United States in 1875. So there's another, there's another little thread. Christmas cards get introduced in 1875. Also took part in developing the cliche by depicting Santa in a snowy and icing icy setting, wearing a big coat. So here's the thing: they're like they're showing the origins of Santa Claus before Coca-Cola gets introduced, 
but Coca-Cola then takes all of that stuff and just solidifies it into this single fiery image that we all identify with to this day. That's my point with all of this, right? Um, So he wears a big coat with a hood lined with white fur, boots, and a cloth bag for toys. The former Bishop Nicholas, deprived of his mitre and cross, was completely unrecognizable as a jolly grandfather with a long white beard. So he really does. I mean, there's that photo. I mean, that's pretty damning. But again, there's no red. He's smoking a uh, smoking a pipe. Um, I don't know, man. Coca-Cola claims ownership of Santa Claus. I don't think that's I really don't when I I mean, I'm coming from at this from a Jewish perspective, a non-Christian perspective. But I really don't think that's such a far fetched idea that Coca-Cola claims ownership of Santa Claus. The origin, I mean, I know, obviously it, it's older than than that, but but it just I'm talking about the modernized version. The origin of the red color of Santa Claus outfit is a mystery. I I don't I don't think it's much of a mystery, man. I mean, it's Coca Cola. Uh, NAS Santa Claus clothes were neither red as Coca Cola Santa Claus would later be. So before before Coca Cola Santa Claus is kind of you know he's got this brown thing going on but the odin version the english odin version he wears a jaw a, a crown of holly he's dressed in green so that there that's where the green and the red come from um so nast's santa claus clothes were neither red as coca-cola santa claus would later be nor green as those of saint nicholas often were but rather brown with short bristles in accordance with the description contained in clement clark moore's poem a visit from saint nicholas that's circa 1880, more commonly known as the night not the night before Christmas. He was dressed in all fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot because he comes down the chimney. But then in 1875, Lewis Prang, the father of the American Christmas card, printed a series of postcards with a Santa Claus in a red costume. Okay, all right, maybe I should just maybe I should just put myself uh, take myself out of the oven. I'm I'm cooked here. Uh, I, I just was really, really trying to synonymously associate St. Nick and Coca-Cola. And I just, I'm wrong. I'm just purely wrong. It seems that even the red isn't the invention of um, <laughs> Santa Claus. Santa Claus, Maine, rocked him like a hurricane, says Barnacle Bill. Um, did he invent the costume's red color? So Louis didn't, probably not. But he is the one remembered in history. In 1931, which is pretty modern considering everything we just spoke about, um, in 1931, Coca-Cola decided to broaden its market to children. The Atlanta-based company asked Hayden uh, Sundblom, uh, an illustrator of Swedish descent, there is kind of like a Swedish bend to Santa Claus in that kind of way, to depict a paunchy, smiling Santa Claus dressed in red with ruddy cheeks and an elvish look. I, I'm that look, that is the modern look of Santa Claus that comes from Coca-Cola from this guy. Sunblom drew on Amel- American illustrations, uh, drew on American illustrations and those of one of his compatriots, Jenny Nystrom. Beginning in 1881, she had published postcards depicting Nordic elves that so that's where the elves come from, that also followed St. Nicholas tradition. Her paintings remain popular in Sweden today where they are reprinted every year. Above all, Coca-Cola's red and white colors determine those of Santa Claus's contemporary uniform. As for France, it adopted the Santa Claus theme by giving him nice big cheeks, a red costume and a sack filled with toys and officially renaming him Le Le Père Noël. In the aftermath of World War II, the figure of Santa Claus became well-established as Coca-Cola and chewing gum proving that its popularity was tied to America's prestige in France and the immediate post-war period. Hmm. And then let's see, here is five things you never knew about Santa Claus and Coca-Cola. Let's see what, let's see what they say. Let's see what they say. They say Santa is here to stay here. All right. We're going to really sp- Santa Claus has been featured in Coke ads since the 1920s. Okay. Look at that. Those are the earliest versions of him. So cool. 
Coca-Cola helped shape the image of Santa. So let's see. This is the Coca. All right. So this is the Coca-Cola company um, uh, saying this. We have to, uh, you know, uh, take that with a grain of salt. In 1931, the company began placing Coca-Cola ads in popular magazines. Archie Lee, the Darcy advertising agency executive working with the Coca-Cola company, wanted the campaign to show a wholesome Santa who was both realistic and symbolic. So Coca-Cola commissioned Michigan born illustrator Hayden Sonblom, the guy we just talked about, to develop an advertising images using Santa Claus shown uh, showing Santa himself, not a man dressed as Santa for inspiration. Uh, the artist turned to Clement Clark Moore's 1822 poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, commonly known as the, twi uh, the Night Before Christmas. Moore's description of St. Nick led to an image of a warm, friendly, pleasantly plump and human Santa. And even though it's often said that Santa wears a red coat because red is the color of Coca-Cola, Santa appeared in a red, cola, in a red coat before uh, Sunblom painted him. However... Coca-Cola's brand color is red. So therefore St. Nick became Santa Claus became synonymous with red because of Coca-Cola, not despite Coca-Cola. It, it solidified it. And that's where I guess that's the credit I want to give Coca-Cola. Uh, this Santa Claus deb uh, debuted in, uh, debuted in uh, 1931 in Coke ads in the Saturday Evening Post and appeared regularly in the magazine as well as the Ladies Home Journal and National Geographic and the New Yorker and others. From 1931 to 1964, Coca-Cola advertising showed Santa delivering toys and playing with them, uh, pausing to read a letter and enjoy a Coke, visiting with the children who stayed up to greet him, and raiding the refrigerators at a number of homes. The original oil paintings... Uh, created were adapted for Coca-Cola advertising in magazines and on store displays, billboards, posters, calendars, and plush dolls. Many of those items today are popular collectibles. Man, what I wouldn't give for some of those original oil paintings. Um, the final version of Santa Claus was created in 1964, but for several decades to follow, Coca-Cola advertising featured images of Santa based on the original works. These paintings are some of the most prized pieces in art collection in the company's archives department and have been on exhibit around the world in famous locales, including the Louvre in Paris and the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, and the Eastern, Eastern Department Store in Tokyo and the NK Department Store in Stockholm. Many of the original paintings can be seen on display at the World Coca Cola, uh, at the World of Coca Cola in Atlanta, Georgia. Beautiful, man. That is beautiful. Beautiful artwork, man. Truly. The new Santa was based on a salesman. So uh, Sunblom painted the image of Santa using a live model. His friend, Lou Prentice. Wow, a retired salesman. That is the basis of Santa Claus. When Prentice passed away, uh, Sunblum used himself as a model, painting while looking in the mirror. Finally, he began relying on photographs to create the image of St. Nick. Oh, wow. That is That blows my mind. So it's based on a dude. There's a dude. Santa Claus got a new friend in 1942. That's Sprite Boy. Interesting. Santa became animated in 2001. So they, I guess the first time they ever did an animation, which that seems weird that it would be as late as 2001. And it was created by an Academy Award-winning animator named Alexandre Petrov. Hmm. All right. Um, and here's Coke saying, I'm not going to post this up, but it says, did Coca-Cola create Santa Claus? Coca-Cola did not create the legend of Santa Claus, but Coca-Cola advertising did play a big role in shaping the jolly character we know today. Before 1931, there were many different depictions of Santa Claus around the world, including a tall, gaunt man, an elf. There was even a scary clause. That's that's Krampus. But in 1931, Coca-Cola commissioned illustrator Haddon Sonblom to paint Santa for Christmas advertisements. Those paintings established Santa as a warm, happy character with human features, including rosy cheeks, a white beard, twinkling eyes, and laughter lines. Um, Sonblom drew inspiration from an 1822. Right. We, so there you go. There, I mean, there you have it, man. And I think, you know, yes, that's Coca-Cola, an evil, you know, corporation, but I think they're, I think they're telling the truth. <laughs> 
Um, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed our um, our show. We'll be back tomorrow night. Uh, I'll I'll be having genre blast uh, film festival director, writer, filmmaker, and novelist now on the show with me. We're going to be talking about the new Nicolas Cage film, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, and I believe we'll be talking about The Northman as well. So tune in. That's going to be tomorrow night live. Uh, if you enjoyed if you enjoyed this show, please make sure to check out the Patreon. There's a new way to support the channel. We now have a thanks button that has been added at the bottom of the screen, you can see it right there. It's a wonderful way to support the channel if you feel like it. No matter what, just watching the show is really helpful and really appreciated. So thank you so much. Um, like I said, also keep, uh, like I said, if you're a Patreon YouTube member, check out the leaving interview. Want to know how you can become a Patreon member? Check it out. Peace and hair grease. Woo! Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full-time, uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk, and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> So right now, I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers, and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee. But it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. <laughs> the YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just wanna thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes, that's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.